So ladies and gentlemen, Marcus Taylor is about to come on and absolutely blow your mind. This dude's doing so many incredible things over in the UK, and I love having conversations with people around the world. It is epic. Create your your tribe, your your uh, network, your group of friends, and, and people who you really care about and build relationships with around the world. I love having this global uh, connection that we can create through social media, through podcasting, through today's technology. It's freaking beautiful. Before we dive into that conversation, I'm talking to you. You are a world-changing human being. You're an influencer. You're a visionary. You're a high performer. You are courageously growing yourself into your greatest possible self. And I want to support you however I can, whatever that looks like. If it's coming on the 12-hour marathon to share your message, let's explore that. Let's get a conversation scheduled. If it's helping you launch your own platform, Get your message out in the world through your own podcast. Would love to explore that as well. We have uh, quarterly masterminds that help people launch their podcasts. If there's another way that I can support you, just let me know. I'm here for you, and I look forward to growing on the journey with you. You can send me an email, chris at beergps.com. Find me on facebook.com forward slash th3 burns. Definitely send me a message there. Uh, I don't usually just respond to friend requests, but if you send me a message, then we can really start to build a conversation and a relationship. And then also on Instagram, send me a direct message following. It's great, but I really just get to know who you are. So send an introduction and I'm happy to have a conversation with you and go from there. So at I am millionaire Chris is on Instagram. Looking forward to talking to you, whichever method you prefer. Prefer. And next, we're going to talk about the iTunes review of the week. This week, let's see who it is. It's by Sports123789. <laughs> and Sports says, awesome show and host. Love Chris's infectiously positive attitude. Inspirational and uplifting. Absolutely, Sports. That's why I am here to ignite the fire within everyone who is showing up and choosing to be their greatest possible self. So thank you so much for being here, listening, tuning in. You love this content. You love stepping into your growth, into your greatest possible self. And what better way to do it than con con continuously grow yourself every single day. We have new podcast episodes out every single day. So subscribe to the podcast. You can do that on iTunes, beergps.com forward slash iTunes or whatever uh, podcast medium you really love to get your podcast through. Okay. So definitely subscribe. Let us know what you love. Give us a review and what you want to see more of, what you want us, want us to keep doing. We love getting that feedback. Okay. Thanks so much in advance for doing that. Now I'm going to introduce Marcus in just a second here. Before that, grab a piece of paper, grab a pen. This guy is a freaking pro at building businesses, at launching businesses, growing them. And just like he's doing some amazing, amazing things and in the entrepreneur world and business, small and medium sized business world. So uh, there's going to be a ton of great wisdom here. So get excited because this guy is one to watch and uh, let's introduce him. Then we'll bring him on. Marcus Taylor is the founder and CEO of Venture Harbor, a company on a mission to build 100 plus businesses by the year 2100, where each business solves a more ambitious problem than the last and unlocks greater human potential through technology and automation. Marcus is featured in the Forbes 30 Under 30 and bootstrapped Venture Harbor into one of the fastest growing tech companies in the UK with zero funding. And for me, I, I just love the entre entrepreneur online world that we're in. When I see people out there building like real freaking businesses and helping other people build, like coaching is great, uh, authorship is great, podcasting is great. Those are all great businesses and I really have respect and admiration for the people building like businesses, like big businesses. So Marcus, you are are doing that man welcome to becoming your greatest possible self thanks for being here and sharing with our audience all that you're learning all that you're creating and and your journey man it's it's really inspiring yeah no it's a, it's a pleasure to be on the podcast with you Awesome. Awesome, man. So we're going to dive right in to the theme of today. Today's theme is, does your why make you cry? So Marcus, what does that mean to you? Does your why make you cry? How has that shaped your entrepreneurial journey, man? Does your why make you cry? So I. I think for me that it's so important to have a, a reason for what you do mm. that is bigger than just revenue or yeah. hitting some kind of goal. It has to like for, for me it's it's this idea of you know we need to have hundred businesses built by twenty one hundred and each one needs to be more ambitious. Why is that important? Well, because we we want to be bending the growth curves of economies of our customers and ourselves like that for me is 
is this is this kind of why that when I you know if I think about how that makes me feel, it's like okay, that's terrifying, but that's also super exciting. Yeah, yeah, I love it, man. So it's like if you're gonna have a life, you might as well have one where you're playing full full in, you know, everything on the table, and you're you're having fun, you're feeling like a, a thrill, almost an adrenaline rush of what's possible, and, and constantly pressing those boundaries. And I hear you really activating that for yourself. So it's incredible, man. And for people who are just getting to know you and Venture Harbor, and I know you're you're also really big in this Serene app that we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, tell us a little bit more about what you stand for and what your clients come to you for. So, um, so in terms of, of what we do, so Venture Harbor, we're a digital innovation studio. So basically, we, we, we build innovative, um, innovative apps, software, different, different software companies. Mm -hmm. In terms of me, like my my real passion is like this started when I was a kid playing with Lego blocks. Like mm -hmm. I love the the creative process of using like. The, the sort of the technical geeky side of, of technical sol uh, problem solving yeah. and fusing that with creativity. And um, for me, like the really exciting thing we're going through at the moment is there's so much possibility around um, with automation and technology yeah. to solve interesting problems. So that, that for me is why I, I absolutely love it. Wow. So it's like any any problem, it's like you could take a stick to it and like beat it up, so to speak, the most uh, primitive, less least efficient way possible. And that's already happening in the world, so to speak. And we want to solve problems on a global level that, you know, gets to the root of the problem that that totally dissolves it, that makes it basically non-existent. And it's like, how do we do that efficiently? How do we do that in a scalable, leveraged way? And that's that's who you are. That's your whole purpose. And it really really came from, you know, that background in, in Legos and, and putting things together, putting the pieces of the puzzle together to create a beautiful like system or a machine that can, that can do that. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's like, um, I mean, certainly with, with what we found, like, um, cause Venture Harbor started as a service company, mm -hmm. uh, offering consulting and, okay. and we kind of transitioned to, to this sort of more product um, company and, and the big kind of learning for me around that is like, it's just as hard to get one customer as it is to get like 10,000. Like it's just, it's just how you spend the hours in the day that completely transfer, transforms, what, you know, what it is you do. So I, I love that sort of, um, like scaled up thinking. Yeah, I love it. I love it, man. So I want to go back into the journey, talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, from Legos to growing through that phase. Like, how did how did entrepreneurship become a thing for you? And you know, really the focus on businesses, especially. How did you get into business? So I think it, I think it came through through music. Mm -hmm. um, when I was uh, so I. There were two kind of themes in my life that I didn't expect to merge, but, but they did, which is music and computers. Mm. So I, I learned to code when I was 10 years old, and I think I, I started playing playing guitar or something when I was about 13. Mm. And when I was sort of like 15, 16, I, I started to run these like gigs around Oxfordshire where I live. Mm. And that was giving me like uh, an education in entrepreneurship. I had to... You know, I was using my computer to design tickets and print tickets. I was having to kind of sell to my friends at school and organize bands, which, you know, there's so many parallels to entrepreneurship. Yeah. Whereas it, to me, it was just, I'm, you know, I'm just a kid putting on a gig at the local village hall. Um, and this just grew and grew. Like I started when I was like 16, I was getting a little bit more into like HTML. Mm -hmm. um, so I started to kind of like build MySpace websites for bands. Mm. Um, and it just kind of grew from there until um, I didn't go to university. I instead I, I joined like a local marketing agency. Yeah. And I was so fascinated by what I was learning in the day. Like we were working on these big brand accounts, mm. and I'd go home every day and just want to tell the music community about that. So my first business was um, a website called The Musician's Guide, mm. where I was just sharing basically everything I learned in my day job about SEO and digital marketing yeah. with musicians and applying it to how they can uh, get their music out there mm -hmm. and get more gigs, get record labels using online marketing. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So it's like that, 
you had this natural tendency to do what you love, which was like music and, and coding and technology, put that all together and, and really learn promoting and marketing. And then you had a job that really helped you fuel those skills and get more distinctions, gain more expertise in that process of marketing, SEO, all that good stuff so that you could really be more effective at getting the results, at, at doing the promotion, at driving traffic, at creating sales for tickets and getting people to live events. That's awesome, man. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, so cool. That's that's rad. So I think a lot of people, you know, they don't start off with that foundation of, of you know, having it built into them, so to speak. You kind of like, you found your passions early on. I'm just curious, what what would you say to someone who's who's still looking for, like, what is their sweet sweet spot? What are, what are their gifts and talents and abilities to bring together to live their purpose? I, th- I think, like, the, the best advice that I'd have is is to really just kind of is to just do stuff mm, like yeah. even if it's small like just the more you can like looking back at kind of how I got to where um where I am now like so much came down to just this kind of naivety of thinking that things were like I just did stuff not realizing what I was getting myself into yeah yeah um and I think when you just try stuff when you know if you've got an idea for for an app don't overthink it. Don't like, don't get into this all like, well, what if it fails and you know, how much is it going to cost? Like just take the first step and you'll be surprised at how quickly momentum can build. Yeah. I love it. And I also, I hear that you didn't necessarily have a, a long-term plan of how music and coding and technology would all work together. Like you, you didn't, but you just showed up and you said, Hey, what do I enjoy? What, what, what am I curious about? What are my natural tendencies for things that draw my passion, that draw my interest? And it's like just showing up and doing those things. It kind of, the pieces unfolded as, as you did it. So I think the, the crux, the main point is, for people to go after things that you're interested in. What what are you curious about? What makes you come alive? What excites you? And even if it's, if you know, I think a lot of people are like, oh, well, I don't know what I'm excited about. Just go freaking do things. Get out of your comfort zone and try new things. And it sounds like you you had early early examples of what to what to do you kind of just fell into music fell into tech and it's like okay well i like this but if you were let's say 10 years later you would still say hey well what do i want to do what what interests me and you would go explore and find out what what lights you up man so that's really cool and uh, i want to fast forward again and talk about how did venture harbor start you know where where did this desire to serve companies and and really you know, add more value and help them grow, help them scale. Where did that transition happen from the music career? So it was a very kind of um, evolutionary thing. So so very similar to the process of kind of, um, you know, going from coding and music to um, kind of merging those, those two, those two interests. Venture Harbor's found, like formation was very similar in that I, I was kind of just creating all these in my day job, I was creating all these experiments and just websites in the evenings. Yeah. And I got to a point where I was generating more income from these side projects I built than my actual job. That's amazing. And I had to kind of like, at that point, it was like, okay, I need to legally create a company yep. to put these, like, these things into. Um, so it was almost like company formation out of necessity rather than this sort of big planned mm. um, event. And Venture Harbor has been a very fluid company, I'd say, like, because for better or or worse, like, we started as um, this kind of holding company for these ideas. Mm -hmm. We then naturally kind of morphed into being a, uh, like, marketing consultancy in the music industry because a lot of music companies had seen what we had done, or I should say what I had done at that point. And said, hey, Marcus, like, we love what you've done with the Musician's Guide. Can we pay you a retainer to, to do that for us? So that was kind of like for a few years, it was just kind of this consultancy. Then I decided that I, d- I didn't like clients. <laughs> but I, I kind of just wanted to go back to my childhood days, of like me in a Lego box, building products. That's what I, I truly love doing. And so we, the sort of the clients gradually, the client work sort of, uh, we, we slowed that down. Yeah. And then, while we were doing that, we were kind of building up the product revenue. So it was a fairly smooth transition 
um, to move from like service based to, to product based. And that mm. from then we just kind of tightened up like, okay, what is it we stand for? What's the vision here? What are we trying to do? And then that's kind of then evolved into the what Fetch Harbor is today. Mm. Powerful. Do you find a lot of people are not clear on what they stand for and what they want to do in their organization or their company? Definitely, yeah. It's um, I, I feel we're um, for Venture Harbor. It's always been a massive challenge for us because because we have so many different ventures, uh, kind of really honing in on like what is that clear why that we stand for. It is something that we even challenge we we find challenging today, and it's arguably never been more important because getting the whole team behind this this kind of clear vision and for us like that's such an important thing but yeah. um yeah i find most companies are kind of like clear perhaps clearer than, than we are but mm-hmm. it's still something that i know everyone um well, i shouldn't say everyone but a lot of people struggle with yeah getting yeah that. man yeah it's powerful so like really having the vision first cuz like if you if you don't have the vision you're just kind of wandering around but i think you you had a natural natural success and a natural flow of hey here's what we're already doing great at and i think a lot of people struggle with recognizing that or jumping into that flow to begin with like hey where's where's the cash flow you know like where where is it a lot of people are just struggling to find that but um to to find that i think it really takes hey what do i want to be good at what do i want to be great at what do i want to be known for and then of of course over time you'll evolve and for you you found hey clients are great and i really want to go back to the drawing board of what i love putting pieces of the puzzle together building systems building frameworks and things that can scale and make a huge, huge impact like that. That leverage is super important. Um, so you started working on different apps, different projects. Can you tell us a little bit more about like how how things evolved for you in that aspect? Yeah. So we um so the first um the first few ventures. Uh, so we had the music sites which were doing quite well. Yeah. And then we had um you know I I was kind of. Uh, I, I had taken like the four hour work week lifestyle. I was living in Australia with my girlfriend, working, you know, running it all from a laptop. Mm-hmm. And life was all good. Everything was, was going smooth. And of course, there's a but here. Um, we, I woke up one day, looked at my analytics, and we had been hit by a, a Google update. Mm-hmm. So basically, all of our revenue dried up overnight wow. um, and had to kind of rethink okay, like, what are we going to do here? How, how does, uh, how do we sort of get back from this? So, um, started to kind of just, just get a little bit smarter with kind of thinking a bit more long-term of the ventures that, that we were building. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there were a few really kind of, we had a few really nice, um, successes from there. One, uh, randomly was like a financial trading website called Broken Oats. Oh, cool. Um, I actually built this out of, um, one of the companies that I was working with at the time was a finance company and it was the first company I was not able to get results for from uh, when we were doing the digital consulting. Right. And it shook me up so much that like I had to build this a business in the finance space just to prove to myself that like it wasn't me that, that, that was the problem. Wow. Uh, mm-hmm. And that grew into one of our fastest growing or highest revenue ventures. And then that funded all of the um the other ventures that we've built since then. Wow, amazing, amazing. So at what point did you say, hey, this productivity and focus, it's a severe handicap. There's there's like, you know, it, it, people are disempowered with their productivity and their their focus. And when did that become apparent for you? For me, like the, it really hit home last, last summer. Um, I just remember going to work most days and you know, like most people running a company or, or even working in a company, like experience this problem of, okay, I've got these 17 things going on. What do I do? Like, do I focus on marketing today? Do I, you know, sort out the financing? Like there's so many things that you can focus on. And we had that like times nine because it was like all these different ventures we could have focused on anything. Yeah. Um, and so last year I kind of just really started to dive deep into, okay, how do I solve this problem? How do I kind of hack my own focus Mm. so that I can kind of always know what is the one most important thing for me to do today so that I didn't get overwhelmed and could be more effective. Yeah, that's powerful. So it's like 
you you knew you had all these different passions, all these different things that you could work on, and it was a a kind of a dilemma for yourself saying there's so many different directions to go. How do I have a systemized approach to make sure I'm focusing on the top priority, the one thing that's going to make the biggest difference? Yeah, yeah, it was it was like we had three ventures on an exponential growth curve at the same time. So it was like it wasn't even obvious to be like, okay, which one is going to make the most money or which wow. one is going to have the most impact? It was like, okay, we've got three that are all kind of going gangbusters. How do, how do we how do we pick? Yeah, yeah. So so what did you what did you start experimenting with? What did what research did you start doing to to get that clarity and start putting the systems in place? So um, so I started to I was basically trying to, to do two things. I wanted to eliminate things that were distracting me and basically negatively affecting my focus. Yeah. And then I wanted to add things that would increase my focus and kind of uh, positively add, add to that. So on the, on the sort of the, the negative or, or like breaking up distractions, there's a lot of things like um, I installed kind of trackers, uh, rescue time on my PC, yep. uh, trackers on my phone, see like where was I spending my time. Yep. Um, and from there, it was apparent that um, I my phone was a big one. Like I was spending, I think, 35, 40 minutes a day on my phone. Wow. And so this, the solution was kind of, my phone is now super, super minimal. There's like no apps on it, yeah. um, no social media. I, I set up um, it, it very kind of geeky things. So that like whenever I wanted to get into focus work on my computer, uh-huh. I pressed the button and it would put my phone on airplane mode wherever it, it was. Wow. Um, Experimental with like AI generates focus music to kind of trigger certain brain waves that increase the focus. Um, all, all kinds of like we've um, in the office we've we've got these like brain monitoring uh, like EEG devices. Yeah, we're playing around with like our office is ridiculous. Like we've we've got like trampolines and people always walking around. Like, Why? You know that thing where like if you've had something in your office for so long you stop seeing it or in your house. Yep. It's kind of like that with us. Like we've got trampolines and, and weird stuff, and and like when our accountants come, we're like, oh yeah, that's that's kind of a bit weird. We have to explain why we have that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just testing different kinds of exercise, coffee, how to sort of break your day up, loads of stuff yeah. that all affects me. Wow, that's that's powerful, man. So I think that I love what you said. A lot of really cool stuff in there. One is the the app Rescue Time, which really helps people understand where are they spending their time on their computer. And I know that you you said that you mentioned brain waves to get get us into optimal states of of learning and things like that. I've also experimented a lot with like isochronic tones and binaural beats and things like that to you know generate certain types of brain patterns so that I'm optimally equipped for whatever the task is. If I want to be drawing or creative or imaginative, then I want a certain type of brainwave. And if I want to be, let's say, focused and working on spreadsheets and just cranking out, you know, data, data crunching or something like that, then I want a different type of, of brainwave. So like for people to know what, what is missing, what's, what's their weakest link? How do you, how do you address where people might be falling short? Cause you, you had your own process of uh, evolution and becoming aware of what might be stopping you from being massively uh, in flow, so to speak. How do you teach the the people who you work with or with your app? How do you teach people that? So we 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 try to find like general like universal truths. So mm-hmm. everyone is different, but there's there's a few kind of universal things. Like m- the majority of people, their biggest distraction is going to be their phone. So mm-hmm. you think like um, airplane mode and eliminating notifications from your phone. Like that's a really easy win. That like 99% of people is going to make a big difference yeah um we did a we commissioned our own uh study using the eeg's um brain monitoring stuff around focus music and we found while there is like variation person to person generally speaking we found there were only two genres of music that consistently increased focus better than silence wow. um, with the ambient music and classical Mm. But classical is a bit of a dangerous territory because there's it, you know, you can have really sort of intense, crazy violins going all over the place. Yep. Classical, and then you can have chill. As a general rule of thumb, it's like for focusing, you want the music to be quite sort of slow, yeah. not it needs to be interesting enough that it kind of 
is not dull, but not so interesting that it's it's distracting. Wow. Um, but yeah, there's a post I think up on like sereneapp.com forward slash focus hyphen music mm-hmm. where we put out all of the data um, from from that study. Yeah, amazing. And what what is the the ultimate objective with that the app app? You know, Serene, and can you tell us a little bit more about your mission with that, and you know what what we need to know about it, and and how we can start using it to increase our productivity and our focus. So it's for Serene is simply to help people get their focus back. Mm. Um, and we want to do that, you know, at, at the largest scale possible. I think, you know, almost everyone that I'm speaking to these days are, if you know, whether they're working from, a, from an office or whether they're a freelancer working from home, like we all struggle with this problem of constant distractions that are keeping us from getting into deep focused work and, it's that deep focused work that is becoming more rare, more valuable, and is necessary if we're going to kind of create, uh, you know, the impact that we have in our heads. So that's the goal of Serene. In terms of what it does, um, what we're trying to create with Serene is being able to get into that deep, deep focused state in one click. Mm. So the idea is you press, you know, command whatever it is on your on your Mac. And that automatically puts your phone on airplane mode. It plays AI-generated focus music that we've kind of optimized and measured. It shuts down distracting apps like Slack and mm. Skype and all these things where people are bugging you, blocks you from going uh, to distracting social media sites, mm. just kind of helps keep you focused. And loads of things like working in interval, uh, timed intervals, mm. uh, setting one goal, breaking your day in sessions. We've kind of just taken all of these best practices and rather than you having to sort of like, you know, use six or seven different tools to have that that kind of optimal um, structure, that's all built in Serene to kind of help guide you to be more more focused. Wow, it's amazing. And are you are you focused on building community with this? Is like how how are you going about sharing about this app and getting people engaged with it and wanting to use it? So we're super early stage. So we're we're in the private alpha stage at the moment, uh, with several hundred people using it. Awesome. Um, the private beta, I think, is like literally coming out in the next few weeks. Um, so anyone listening and wants to try it, SereneApp.com. There, that's like a referral thing um, to uh, to request an invite. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so we're we're very very kind of early stage in, in building up that community. But absolutely, like. Getting at the moment, we, we're kind of just listening to her, like what you know. This we love it. This works great for us. But the next step is understanding: is this something that? How do we make it fit different people's ways of working? Yeah, yeah, that's that's amazing. What what did you learn in your previous? Uh, previous ventures and the other exponentially growing ventures that you got going on and and especially had success with what did you learn in there about focus and productivity that you're bringing forward to serene a a big part of it is is like structuring um structuring your day and and your week so um so for us for example it became apparent that um we had to structure our time in this kind of 70 20 10 ratio where like 70 percent of our time was growing our existing portfolio 20 percent was working on the latest venture and 10 percent was doing experimental crazy stuff that makes no sense but may turn into these kind of moonshot ideas yeah and that that concept is modeled off of how bees work mm. um so bees i think have the same ratio of like 70 percent of the bees kind of um, we'll find like the optimal pathway to flower to get um, the pollen. Yep. And uh, they'll kind of like all sort of follow that one path. Whereas like the 20, 10% of the other bees, they do this like wiggle dance, which tells them how to get to the flower. 20% or like 10% of the bees completely ignore that and will travel for miles um, to find flowers that make, it makes no sense from an evolutionary perspective that they would go so far but what they found was that for the hive to survive over a long period of time you need that 10 20 percent of bees to go further and do kind of crazy stuff because if 
if the, the flowers nearby caught fire or ran out, they're relying on the 10, 20% of the bees to kind of um, survive that. So we have the same, we have the same pattern. And with Serene, we just, we found that like we need to know like today is the day where we're going to work on this venture. Mm. And not only that, but like this is the one goal that we're going to focus on today. And we're going to break that up into like five sessions yeah. so that we kind of at any given point, you know precisely what you need to focus on to hit the sort of one day goal, the one month, the three month. Mm. And then that sort of extrapolates to the big sort of 10, 25, 100 year vision. I love it. I love it, Marcus. This is gold. And I really want for people to highlight, like ask yourself, are you are you actively implementing these kinds of things, these strategies, you know, focused work sessions, deep work sessions? Are you do you feel like you're getting as much as you possibly can done? Because if not, it's time to really start readjusting things. And the Serene app is one of the ways that you can do that. You can also just make a commitment to yourself and say, hey, I want to explore this more. I want to I want to build better habits, better practices to be more productive. Because I mean, look at this guy, Marcus, he's freaking on fire building these different ventures. And like most people can't even do one, let alone three or five or 10 different things juggling all that. So, you know, it's, it's really amazing what you are, are creating so far. And I just, I want our audience to know it's possible. You know, it's, it's so possible, especially with the right habits, with the right mindset, with the right team and people around you, like anything is freaking possible. So uh, also I want people to, to take action on this. If, if this is something that's important to you, if you're really committed to getting your, your efforts and your flow and your deep work into alignment, managing your time, managing your boundaries, and, and being effective, priority management, really. Um, if that's something that's a huge, huge commitment for you, I want you to take a screenshot of this Facebook Live or podcast. Take a screenshot of it, put it up on your stories and tag me on Facebook or tag, tag me on Instagram at I am Millionaire Chris. And I'll make sure I repost it and tag Marcus and all that good stuff because it's really you get to make this commitment to yourself and you get to take action on this because it's so important. And, and Marcus, this is gold. I also wanted to talk to you because you've, you're juggling all these different events. Uh, how important has building a team and powerful teams been for you to create that success? Really important. And um, I'll be completely honest, like in the early days, I thought I was this kind of like genius. I could do everything myself. Yep. I didn't need a team. Um, and I was so wrong. Like I, you know, I, I was able to grow the company to a certain point, sure. And that was, you know, fine, impressive. Mm -hmm. But there came a point where it really sort of hit a plateau. And I, I assembled a, a team of amazing people. We've got like ex-Google engineers and wow. have like a world champion jiu-jitsu fighter. Like it, it was an absolute dream team. And it was phenomenal and like such a humbling thing for me to see that, wow, like the decisions that, that these people have made have literally grown us like 10x faster. Damn. Like for me, it's like, I, you know, I thought I was great until I saw these people who are not entrepreneurs necessarily. Like they're, they're entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. but they're not necessarily entrepreneurs. But their ideas are still amazing. And the impact that they're having uh, is incredible. And for me, it's like still a learning curve. Like I am, um, I still struggle with, with management. I still, you know, building a team is, is a really hard thing. But even with all the experience in the world, it's, it's still really hard. Yeah. Um, but so rewarding when you get it right and yeah that's something that i'm just constantly striving for how do i get better at just bringing the right people on and mm. giving them everything they need for them to thrive as well yeah what, what do you think it was about you in how you communicated your vision and what you were working on what what was it about you and how you showed up that made people say yes to you to join your team I, th I think there's sort of two, if I, if I had to guess, I think it's two things. I, I think one is the sort of the, the naive ambition of, you know, like my, my view has always been like, this company is going to be insane. Like we are, like whether we like it or not, this is likely to be a billion dollar company at some point. Like I, it's not a goal. Like I don't necessarily aspire to that. That's not the point that I'm doing it, but it probably will be. And um, and everything that we're doing, like it's it's built around this this point of ambition, and mm. we, we're doing stuff that is deliberately hard, out of personal growth. Mm. And I think the other part of it is, um, I I I've always been I, I like to think just very genuine with my team. Like I, mm. what I if I say something, you know, like 
I, I care for my team so much. I go out of my way to really support them, their families, and do stuff that is, um, you know, just just what a you know a good human being would would be. And I think those two things in combination, if you're a great person but you don't have the vision to inspire, you you know that's problematic. Equally, if you've got this big vision but you're going to leave the people behind, that's also problematic. So I think it's that combination that has, has really helped. Wow. It's powerful, man. Powerful. Um, what are some other distractions that people might be uh, getting stopped by that, that they need to look out for or ways that their time is escaping them, ways that they're, they're not being as productive as they, as they could be? People. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Like, like people, people are a, a big distraction probably enough. Like this, uh, one of the things that we did with the Serena, Serena which is like quite funny, but actually has a big impact is we um do you know like the philip hughes lights that you can get like yep. uh um and like the you get like the strip lights which go different colors yep so we've uh we've kind of attached those to all the desks in our office um and the serene app can actually talk to the philip hughes lights so that when you go into serene mode and you want to focus the lights in our in our, our office like they all turn red wow. so it tells people like don't distract don't distract Andrew. He's currently coding. Um, and then if it turns green, you know, he's on a break and you can talk to him. So just kind of like managing people's expectations of when they can reach out to you. Uh, it's been for us really, really effective. How can someone do that outside of a workplace? I mean, this sounds, sounds genius for corporations and things like that. And even small businesses who want to be more effective with their time. This is gold. What about people, let's say entrepreneurs or solopreneurs that don't have the team in proximity to them what would you recommend for them so so our, our kind of like the main audience um if you like for serene is like we're building it for remote workers so we're yeah. very much kind of thinking like this is for freelancers this is yeah. for entrepreneurs people um so the the kind of the script licensing is like a funny thing that we did that for us is helpful but not it's helpful. awesome it's so awesome <laughs> uh, but in terms of of people working uh work you know working from home office working home um, a, a big thing is like that concept, but applying it to your digital communication. So for us, we use Slack. Yep. And so when we go into stream mode, we do things like up, automatically update like our status on Slack to away. So it stops mm. um, colleagues um, or clients being able to contact us. Yeah. Um, so it's the same concept. It's just kind of signaling to let people know. Um, and even in your house, like, I've actually thought of here in my home office, like, do I attach like a strip light to the outside of my office door yeah. to, uh, to like let people, like, let my, my, um, fiance know, like, like, don't come in now. I'm working. <laughs> yeah. I guess you can find the same thing to, uh, at home. That's rad, man. I love it. I love it. It's cool. And I think it's, it's like really being able to communicate with other people and maintain boundaries. I think a lot of people struggle with maintaining boundaries. And if you just set up the systems to communicate that for you, so you don't have to be, let's say, micromanaging and responding whenever someone says, hey, I need something. You don't have to physically take the time to say, hey, I'm in the middle of something, but you just have automated systems that do it for you. That's That's like that keeps you in the flow. It's like trusting that your boundaries and your productivity space is being maintained. That's peace of mind, man. My, um, my old business coach, he used to, he used to say to me like 99% of your problems are a result of, um, uh, miscommunication. Wow. And so, so much of, of like what, as a, you know, running a, running a company, so much of what I do is just eliminating miscommunication mm. and so expectations so things like serene like that sound you know it's a funny little feature having like the things on desks but really what it's doing is it's eliminating miscommunication like yeah. when some, when you're in the middle of writing code or writing a book or doing something that like you're super in the flow like when someone comes and taps you on the shoulder it's like hey do you want a do you want a coffee that's like that stuff wears away yeah. at you over a long time and really kind of inhibits you so it's i think like that kind of stuff is it's it's small but it makes a big difference and in relationships that's huge like eliminating miscommunication um and like all this stuff around like automation and tech like i totally apply it at like a personal level as well like even having like systems around like okay what food do we order this week yep. how the cat is fed like all this stuff like it, 
has potential for miscommunication and you can build systems to eliminate that. Yeah. Yeah. And and I, I hear it's you're intentional about creating the expectation and the communication up front. So you don't have to wait until the you get the request. You know, it's like in encoding, like you can send things before there's a, a request for the information. It's like if you can just keep delivering it out before there's ever the request, then you 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 minimize that step of someone coming to you. And I think uh, a great example of this is like Steve Jobs. He would he would wear the same thing over and over again, right? So he wouldn't have to choose different outfits, right? He would he would just like that is, he just constantly, that's who I am. That's who I am. There's, there's no choice. There's no wasted um, energy. Or I think that there's a thing called decision fatigue, where the, the more decisions you make throughout the day, the tired and the more, uh, the less quality your decisions will be. So it's like in the morning, you have really high meter of, of decision energy and juice and fuel. But at the end of the day, if you see something tempting or if someone, you know, comes and says, hey, can I borrow a minute of your time? You're less likely to maintain those boundaries because you're, you've been, you know, making decisions all day long. So you, you might eat food that isn't as healthy for you versus let's say you plan your food in the morning and you say, Hey, I'm going to have this, this, and this throughout the day. So I don't even need to think about what I'm going to eat later in the day. It's just really setting yourself up to win, preparing to, to succeed before you even begin. It's, it's amazing. 100%. Yeah. It's incredible. I love this. I love this, Marcus. So this is a lot of fun. And I want to talk about, you know, entrepreneurship in general. Is there any other wisdom or guidance that you give to people out there who are who are building their dreams, who want to make a big impact in the world? What else would you share with them, man? I think I think it depends on the the the, the situation, the circumstance. But I, I think like another thing that I'd I'd you know be happy to kind of go into is the sort of um like like Venture Harbor, I started it with like five hundred pounds in the bank and a broken laptop. Like wow. I've never taken funding, um, which I'm very generally very against. And for me, it's like painful to see that our culture rewards this idea of you know like things like Shark Tank and yeah. Yeah. If you if you've got an idea, you have to kind of get someone else's permission and validation to build it. Wow. Um, that for me is like just not the right way to approach it. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm massively kind of advocate this, the bootstrapping approach, mm -hmm. not only from a sort of a structural revenue, like, like there's a boring side to it that makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. but there's also a psychological aspect to it that, um, and personal aspect, but it's also amazing. Like mm -hmm. there's no seeking validation. Like you, you make the decision, like if you want to build it, your customers are going to be your investors. They're the ones that are going to fund this thing. Like, it, it, for me, it just makes so much sense on so many levels. I don't quite understand fully why that's not the sort of default model for creating businesses. Mm, yeah. And, and I think it's really people believing that they're enough. There's a lot of mindset and paradigm out there that like, I need to rely on somebody else. I need somebody else's help. I need someone else to show me the way to teach me that kind of stuff. You've been a very powerful self-directed learner from a very early age, you know, learning guitar, learning coding, like coding, I think is, I, I, I'm an electrical engineer by degree. I didn't really go into it in terms of uh, corporate work, but I know that the thinking process about it is you have have to be you you must be to succeed and to get joy out of it you must be someone who's constantly like seeking solutions who's constantly working through challenges and and obstacles and and debugging code and like looking for the needle in the haystack making sure that the the system is working seamlessly but i think a lot of people um, don't have that built into them, you know? So what, what would you recommend to help people instill that mentality of, of being solution oriented, of, of taking responsibility for themselves and, and being committed to, to figuring it out and, and doing what they can with what they've got rather than seeking that, that external validation or external help. I think it, it, it comes down to, um, everything is learnable, like every skill you can get better at. And, you know, I am not a good coder. Like my, de my dev team do not let me, I'm not allowed to commit code anymore because <laughs> my developers worked out it takes more time for them to rewrite my code than for them to just like do it themselves. Yeah. So, like by no stretch am I like good at this stuff, but 
when I when I started building websites, I out of necessity because I didn't have any money and I didn't know how to like I sixteen year old knocking on an investor's door saying, Hey, I've got a music website, no chance. Nope. <laughs> like, I had to do this myself. And so, you know, there's so many ways that like I just taught myself some stuff online. The code was awful, it was broken, but it was enough to kind of get something out of that. Yeah. And I think that for me is the key. It's like don't there's a there's a temptation to say like, oh I'm not gonna do this because it's not gonna be perfect or it's gonna be like I'm gonna be embarrassed by it. But that that's kind of everyone has to start somewhere. Like Mozart, I'm sure, was not always amazing. Like everyone starts pretty crap. Yeah. And you have to just start at that point and then, you know, pretty soon things uh snowball and you get to a point where those skills catch up and you can then you know create and either you'll have the resources to to then be able to bring on people that can take that over right. or you'll get to a point where you're actually quite good at it um in my case I, because i've sort of applied that across so many disciplines mm. and it's just helped me become very well right rounded like i can design i can code mm. i understand music i understand the finance industry like i'm kind of very shallow in a lot of areas that mean that make it very very um good for me like in what i'm doing creating ventures because i know a lot across a lot of disciplines but there's not really anything where i'm like really deep um deep in terms of like deep knowledge yeah i'm I'm curious because that's what i hear is you're really good at at mobilizing resources and the right people you know you're being really resourceful and a lot of people say hey you, you like choose one thing and go really really deep and then i also really appreciate your perspective it, it's kind of like know enough to make you dangerous know enough so that like you don't get screwed over in whatever that area is i think a lot of people um uh, you know abdicate so to speak they they give away their responsibility in terms of finances or legal or security or, you know, whatever, even, even online stuff. And I think if you educate ourselves, if we educate ourselves on these different areas, at least just enough to make us dangerous, to make us competent that, you know, we know what's going on at some level, uh, then I think that's a, a winning solution. So I'm, I'm curious, how do you how do you address the people who say you're supposed to go really, really deep with one thing, be an ex- expert with one thing? I think they're both good strategies. I mean, it depends on what what you want to do. Like, mm. there's no, there's definitely no, like, neither of them are right or wrong. Right. Um, it reminds me of the Napoleon Hill, uh, the, you know, there's no value in general knowledge. Mm. Quote in that, like, you know, deep knowledge in a specific area can be very, very valuable. Yeah. Um, at the same time, like, what I've seen, particularly in coding, is that it's I would argue that it's more valuable to know how to write a good brief than it is to know how to code up that brief. Wow. Like if you, if you know enough about how like an app generally works and enough to be able to write a brief for an, for an app that a developer could look at and say, yeah, like this makes sense and I know how to take this from here. I think that's a more valuable skill than actually being able to code up that app. Mm. Um, so it's frankly, it's just... like a lot of things are, are kind of commoditized. Yeah. And, you know, like one of the apps that I built, um, which is like r- randomly became the world's first scientifically valid method of measuring comfort zones, that cost $80 to build. And this thing like exploded and got like Ted, did a TED talk and all these crazy things. And like all I did was like write the brief. Mm. Um, there was no actually, like, I didn't do any of the coding for that. Dude, that is, that's so powerful. And what I hear is being able to communicate the vision. That's like the most powerful skill that especially like a leader, a visionary can develop someone who wants to build big things, you know, and and big companies. That's like a leader. That's someone who says, I know what's possible. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to mobilize this person, this person, this resource, that resource, put it all together and say, let's create this. You know, I think uh, Henry Ford is a great example of that saying, 
you know, like I, I, I think he kept asking the engineers like, you know, like to build the, the, what is it? Eight, eight cylinder engine or six cylinder engine, whatever it was back there. And like back then he said, like, just do it. I don't care how you do it, but engineer, just do it. You know, engineering team, it doesn't matter what, what blocks, what things come up we're doing it. And no matter how much the engineering team, you know, griped and moaned and complained, he kept holding that vision. I think that that's, that's so important to be able to communicate it, to be able to uh, create possibility in your team, because the developer may not have the vision that you have, but you have to be able to communicate with them on their level and their understanding and their language so that they can make your dream a reality. Definitely. And it, it's so linked to the question you asked, right? Like, mm. if you go in saying, um, you know, I need this, I need an app built that helps people focus. Right. Like, that's a pretty broad question that is going to be interpreted in one or 200 <laughs> ways. Yes. Because if you ask a question, like, like when I was building that app, um, the uh, Comfort Zone app, like, I had to add that, and it must cost less than $100. Yeah. To the question because because that you know I didn't didn't have the money, um, but that that creates a different solutions. When you say like I need an app that does this for under a hundred dollars, it's when you communicate that to a developer like they're going to approach it in a very different way. Yeah. Um, so I think so much of it is is yeah it's, it's how you communicate it, being very very specific about what you're what you're asking, and very clear. Yeah. Yeah. Powerful. Uh, what What is a lesson or a piece of wisdom that you have been learning recently in your life? What What has been something you've really been learning and growing in, in, in a certain aspect or capacity of your life recently? Um, I think something that's, that's super relevant for me, uh, I mean, so, so many, right? <laughs> uh, I, I think like if I zoom out a little bit, like a, a big thing is just this constant, the value of like constant education mm. and uh, specifically also like, like I, I do a lot of, um, I send myself on like two to three immersive learning things every year. Yeah. Um, daily journaling. And I've just moved over to um, a really cool thing that I, I've kind of pinched from my, my friend Derek Sivers, mm-hmm. just having a journal on every single topic that is relevant for you. Wow. So having like, um, so I've got like a journal on each of my ventures, but also like, you know, journal with thoughts on Venture Harbor's vision, thoughts yeah. on family, thoughts on marriage, like like having one per because what's really cool with that is you can then see the evolution of your thinking over time. Wow. Um so yeah, I, that for me is like super relevant at the moment. Just spending the more time I seem to put into that, mm. like journaling, getting my thoughts out, the more that feels like that's accelerating the knowledge converting into wisdom process. Yeah. This is gold. Marcus, this has been phenomenal. I want to educate people on how they can stay connected with you, what they can do next to continue their journey. And then after that, after we let them know how they will continue growing with you, we're going to do the minute to win it where you share, you know, your, your wisdom, your heartfelt message that you want our audience to get and really take action on. But before we get to the wisdom and sharing, let's tell them how they can stay connected with you. What are their next steps, man? So the best way to keep in touch is um, if you go onto the venturehaber.com website, um, there's a, a form on there with information on how to keep in contact with me and also keep up to date with all the ventures and crazy ideas that we're putting together. Amazing. So VentureHarbor.com, that's V-E-N-T-U-R-E-H-A-R-B-O-U-R.com, VentureHarbor.com. And uh, also definitely go check out the SereneApp.com, www.Serene, S-E-R-E-N-E. App.com, SereneApp.com, and uh, that's that's blowing up right now. Still, still in the beginning phases, it sounds like, but it sounds really, really cool what you're doing, man. And uh, I love love what your your mission is to support people in really getting that focus back. Because I think a lot of people are 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 
frustrated because they're not creating the output and the impact that they know that they're capable as a human being. And so to be able to really give them that sense of fulfillment, like, hey, I did a good job today. Hey, I got my top priorities done today. That's that's what the world needs more of is people who are, who are proud of the work that they're doing and uh, making a big impact. So love what you're doing, Marcus. And let's give our audience the minute to win it. It's a heartfelt message for someone out there who's really stepping into their greatest possible self and growing themselves. What do you have to share with them, man? So I, I think what I, what, um, what I want to share is like, when, when you listen to, to these kind of stories, often it's, you know, there's, there's a, it can sometimes be like the sort of the 14 year overnight success story, right? Like there's so much that's kind of got to, that's had to kind of go, that had to go through to get to this point that isn't seen. And so I, like, I know, like, you know, I've read the, been reading business books, like sometimes it's so overwhelming. And I feel the advice that I needed to hear a while ago is like, just make 1% improvements. Like mathematically, I think there's a really cool thing. It's like, if you make a 1% improvement every day, that's like 130 X improvement in over like one year. Yeah. Um, and it's so much more, I think, accessible to sort of think like, how do I just make something 1% better today? It might be change your pillow for a better pillow. It may be change the oil that you cook with to coconut oil. Like whatever it is, there's so many things that are so easy, cost effective. But if you keep doing that for the rest of your life, that's going to put you in an insanely different point that is so much better and transformative than if you don't take action and sort of stay where you are out of being, you know, sort of analysis paralysis of not being sure how to get to where you want to go. Yeah. Amen. Amen, Marcus, dude. That is so, so powerful advice and wisdom. And coming from you, dude, like you, you're just like, hey, I just kept showing up. I kept doing the work. I kept putting in the time. And that's why you are where you are and, and you'll keep growing. And this is just the beginning for you, man. So really, really grateful for you here. Everyone, follow Marcus. Go to VentureHarbor.com and SereneApp.com. And Marcus, have the best day ever, man. I appreciate you being here and sharing with our audience, brother. been a huge pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome, man. We'll see you soon, okay? Is it? All right.